Hi everyone, welcome back. On behalf of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, and Princeton University, it's my pleasure to welcome you here, uh, to everyone here in the room, to everyone at the partner locations, and everyone tuning in on the live stream. Um, one of the great things about the Summer Institute is all of the people that we get to meet um, for, through organizing it. And so it's a really, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce one of our alums to come and give a presentation. So Abdullah Amaltuk is uh, starting in the fall, will be a professor at MIT in the Sloan School of Management. And he is also an alum from the 2017 program. So he's my family. Um, so his, uh, the group project that he worked on in the second week has now been published. It was a paper about in-group uh, identity and preference uh, for mechanical Turk workers. Um, he also worked on the Fragile Families Challenge and then went back to MIT and formed a team of people that ended up winning on three of the six outcomes in the Fragile Families Challenge. Uh, <laughs> And none of that had anything to do with his actual dissertation, <laughs> um, which is what he's going to talk to us about more today. And one of the themes that we've talked about throughout the Summer Institute is about how changes in scale can open up new scientific possibilities. And I think Abdullah's work really illustrates that beautifully. And another thing that I love about his work is that in addition to doing this scientific research, you also have to solve uh, a tool building problem. That is, to enable the kind of science we want to do, we have to sometimes build new tools. And so Abdullah and his colleagues and team have done a great job of creating an open source tool that allows other people to do the kind of work that they're doing. So he's not just building this tool and keeping it for himself, he's building this tool and making it available to everyone. And some of you, in fact, may be able to use it in your projects during the second week. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Abdullah Amatou. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, for the introduction. As Matt mentioned, I actually participated in the 2017 Summer Institute. It was after the first year of my PhD. And it had a tremendous impact on shaping the rest of my experience as a graduate student, and it continues to shape my experience as a researcher, where I gained from this experience a lot of mentors, friends, and collaborators, and these categories are not mutually exclusive, but as well I got to participate in the Fragile Families Challenge. It inspired a lot of the work that I ended up doing in my PhD. I landed a really cool uh, and great uh, internship from that experience and as well ended up getting a lot of support when I was on the job market last year uh, from the network that I formed and from the support that I've got from the participants and the colleagues that I met in the Summer Institute. I was talking with Matt earlier and he mentioned that I, I thought the 2017 version was amazing and he's telling me that it's even getting better every year so I can only tell you that I'm a bit jealous that I've done it that early on. Maybe I should have waited. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you will enjoy this and hopefully you'll get a lot out of it. So what I'm going to talk about today, and I'm really grateful to be here and talk about, is experiments. And how can you run experiments at a scale that could qualitatively change the type of science that can be done? And I'm sure that Duncan already has talked. So this is not yet working. Yeah. And not the laptop either. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember somehow I thought if I press the forward <laughs> button. It, 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 it will behave differently. <laughs> Um, so let's see. Ah. All right. Woohoo! Mm, I'm not sure. The clicker probably might not work. The, and as well. Trouble with that clicker. And even the. 
okay. thing here. So it has to be clicking on the slide. Okay, sure, okay. no problem. So yeah, so I'm sure that by now, uh, Matt has talked to you about why we should care about running experiments and as well different strategies for running those experiments. And central to my talk is one particular strategy which is on building your own lab experiment. And this is a topic with a long history. I believe psychologists have been running uh, lab experiments since the early 1930s. Social scientists has, uh, have started running group experiments or group interaction experiments since the 1970s or 1960s. And we learned a great deal uh, from those experiments because they provide tight control, high degrees of uh, controlling the environment that the participants are in, but as well at the same time they are optimized for causal inference and testing specific theories. And they don't look vastly different today from the 1960s, so actually maybe to comment on this. So these are pictures from, uh, uh, I pulled from a paper published in the 1969, I believe, uh, about how to set up a lab for running group interaction experiments. And it's pretty fascinating what they actually have done with it because it doesn't look vastly different today, how physical labs actually are designed. And functionally, they are pretty much the same and inherit a lot of the limitations and the criticisms uh, that people have pointed out when it comes to running lab experiments. That is, again, most of the subjects are university, undergraduates, homogeneous population. Uh, there is very, uh, the, the constraint on space means that you can have so many people at any particular point in time. So all group interactions have to remain small and you end up with small sample size as well. You have as well interactions that are short-lived, and here I'm talking in particular for group experiments. The interactions have to be short-lived because there are so many hours you can trap uh, undergraduate students in one place before it comes unethical. And then uh, because of the lab settings, you have to constrain yourself as a researcher to pretty simple and artificial tasks and unnatural settings uh, that can affect their uh, external validity or even their ecological validity. And overall, they are just extremely slow. They are very expensive, hard and difficult to set up. And then it's extremely hard as well to replicate. So if you think about all of these limitations that I've talked about, and you try kind of to roughly map them into these three dimensions of scale, the size, the complexity, and, and the richness of the environment, and as well duration, then these can define the design space of possible experiments. And then if we look at where the physical lab uh, lies in that space, then you will find it somewhere pretty close to the origin. So you have these constraints that limits the design space of possible experiments that you could have. And then the idea of virtual labs, which is just using the web in order to relax some of these constraints. So when it comes by just relaxing the constraint of space, now you can have larger groups with large scale interactions. You can have more sample size. You can uh, have interactions that can last for longer. So when you think about something like uh, the music lab, so it can actually last for a very long period of time. People don't have to be in one place trapped in order to perform the tasks. As well, you can have more real-time interactions. And as well, you have a more immersive environment that is representative of other digital environments that people are used to, and they, they, uh, these results might generalize to, and as well gives you more precise instrumentation and ways of measuring actual behaviors. So with this kind of relaxation of these uh, limitations, some people would say that using this virtual lab experiment paradigm can expand this is my best way of representing how expanding something. It can expand the design space of possible experiments. So it's not just we can change the scale in terms of sample size, so we can run more of the same experiments or similar experiments, but we can run experiments that are qualitatively different from what we were able to run before. And this is all exciting and it's kind of happening, but the reality of 
if we reflect on many of the studies that claim to be using this virtual lab approach and what they are doing, you'll find that there are actually many limitations and many challenges that are preventing them from taking adv advantage of that expanded design space. One thing that we see is that in virtual labs, a lot of the experiments are just physical lab experiments moved online. So they are not really leveraging any of these new capabilities other than running them on Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is kind of another thing for another time. But as well, the types of tasks, the nature of the tasks that they are running, the type of interactions and their durations remain the same to the ones that are run in the physical labs. And then when you want to do something else that actually goes beyond these simple experiments, so something like the music lab, because you've heard about it, or I think Matt did talk about it today. Yeah? So yeah, so something like the music lab, then it will actually require substantial programming experience. It's not actually easy to develop these things. Many researchers don't have necessarily the resources or the ability to program these things themselves. There are a lot of kind of knobs and things that have to be tweaked in order to get an infra digital infrastructure that allows you to run these experiments. So that's one thing. And when you delegate the development to undergraduate students, they don't necessarily understand how uh, some of the design aspects that one has to, to, to carefully kind of uh, uh, administer when they are developing these experiments, or even professional developers who are unaware of some of the design decisions about experimentations, and they are sometimes hard to communicate, might create something that works, but is even internally invalid. So actually, I am saying this because I looked at some experiments that were developed by professional developers, and you'll find things about, for example, the assignment to treatments or the randomizations to be a little bit shady. They are working, but not really in ways that will resolve some of the constraints or the concerns that researchers have about arrival times and things like that. Just because these professional developers don't necessarily understand why they are doing the randomization or what problem they are trying to solve. So that's kind of another challenge that is preventing people to really take advantage of these new opportunities. And another thing that is uh, happening is that because of running a lot of these experiments, uh, that are similar to the ones that are run on the physical lab. Some research actually have shown that you get less statistical power by running the same experiment online than in the physical lab, just because uh, participants have less attention when they are online. You don't really have, like, you don't know who the participants really are. They can really get easily get distracted and do other things. So even the effect sizes sometimes are smaller. So actually by having access to a larger pool and being to run the same or repeat the same experiments many times, you are only compensating kind of for the statistical power that you lost from uh, running the experiment online. So what I wanna argue for is that what we need is a different virtual lab paradigm that will really allow us to take advantage of this expanded design space. Right? Now there are a lot of challenges, there is the opportunities, there is the promise of what virtual labs can deliver, but there are several constraints that are really preventing us from doing that. And actually, what I wanna do to kind of to, to motivate and illustrate that, I wanna talk a little bit about my substantive research. So I'm going to talk about collective intelligence, and this might seem for a couple of slides a little bit disconnected from running experiments online, but I promise you, you will see the relevance and it will make some of the examples I'll give, la give later a little bit more concrete, but as well it's a chance for me to advertise my research because what better place to actually get collaborators than to talk to you guys. So collective intelligence is just the idea that a group of individuals can outperform the average individual or even the best individual in the group when it comes to tasks like problem solving, prediction, forecasting, or estimation. And this is kind of, uh, I think this is a very interesting problem because these collective decision mechanisms or systems affect our lives in so many ways. From medical teams making life and death decisions, literally, to how markets function which, where it provides this mechanism to aggregate private information and reach a consensus value, 
to how democratic systems work, where it aggregates differences in opinions in order to make a decision about who should lead us. And it's very hard to talk about these examples of collective intelligence without people also highlighting examples of collective failures. So people would say that this is evident by how we chose who to lead us, but as well market crashes, uh, harmful and false rumors spread, and we've all been part of teams that are dysfunctional or were ineffective, which I'm sure none of you will experience next week, hopefully. <laughs> But then one important question kind of in that research agenda became, what are the determinants or predictors of collective performance? How can we know whether a group will be wise or not? And sure, many people have asked that questions and they come from different fields and from different domains and subfields and different people would have different opinions and different theories about what matters for collective performance. And Probably, so there is, this is just like an unexhaustive list that I've uh, encountered when I, when I was doing the literature review part of my PhD. And surely all of these things seem to matter, maybe, probably under certain conditions. But then even if you select one of them and see what actually people think about it, so something like communication network, which is the flow of information or social influence or how information can spread in that group, then you have many measures that actually can capture that communication network. So let's take one of them. So I'm trying to summarize kind of that entire literature in unjustly in just a couple of slides. Then they choose a measure that characterizes the network, for example, efficiency. And efficiency is just uh, something that captures how fast information can propagate on the network. And it's surely operationalized a little bit differently across different experiments, but it's kind of one measure that captures it is the average shortest path. So you just measure the shortest path between every individual uh, in the network, and then you look at the average path. So if you look at that measure and see its relationship to collective performance, you'll find that actually there is experimental evidence that as you increase the efficiency of the network, then you increase collective performance. And actually this is kind of, there are it seems kind of intuitive and as well there are multiple explanations there by the different papers. One would say that it makes sense because as you increase efficiency then good solutions can spread quicker and then people can actually find good regions in the solution space to actually uh, converge to and then they end up with having higher performance. So the speed of, spread of this speed of information propagation is positively uh, correlated or associated with in these experiments to group performance. Another explanation is that these uh, efficient networks, they tend to be decentralized. So everyone's initial belief is equally weighted. So it actually represents some sort of a democratic process. And then if people are in this, uh, w uh, beliefs are equally weighted and you have idiosyncratic errors, then they will cancel out and then you will converge at the truth. So these two explanations for why efficiency should actually increase collective performance. But then simultaneously, you have other experimental evidence that finds exactly the opposite result where they tell you that actually if you increase the efficiency, then you actually reduce collective performance. And although these results seem a little bit counterintuitive, they actually have a plausible explanation. One is that as you increase the efficiency, the group or the crowd can uh, converge prematurely to a solution, to a local optima, so they don't get to actually explore enough, and they converge very quickly in their opinions, and then they co might converge on suboptimal solution, and that's why they wouldn't actually do well. And a little bit of inefficiency will actually increase the level of exploration and the propagation of information, so you will end up with even a better solution. So while all of these experimental results that are run using some sort of virtual labs, they actually they make sense in isolation. When you look at them collectively, then what you've learned is that efficiency can improve or reduce collective performance. And 
this is not this is not only about that one particular measure and that one particular thing that people think the, that people think matters but if you look at anything in this list this is kind of how the literature would look like whether this uh, the ability of the skill members matter uh, is something that you will find experimental evidence that can go in different directions their social perceptiveness uh, skill diversity and you get the idea so i spent a big chunk of my phd time just being confused, trying to kind of know what my contribution should be, and at the same time trying to synthesize or understand what's, what's, what's going on. And I can only imagine that if someone would want to use the, sci the experimental scientific evidence to design a policy in the real world or in organizations or in communities to make teams and, uh, and, and collectives perform better, bet better and improve, they will be as well rightly confused because anything they choose, they'll find an evidence that this is the best thing that they could have done or the worst thing. And without getting into so much details of this one, which, has, which is kind of a whole chapter in the thesis to make the formalism of the language, one argument that I make is that one of the reasons of these inconsistent, uh, inconsistencies exist in the literature, and we surely can talk about many other reasons that can lead to that, is that people choose implicit parameters about their experiment that interact with their treatment and don't think that they matter much that can actually affect the results and reverse it. And to make that more concrete kind of conceptually, without getting into many, any of the technical details, usually when you think about an experiment and you decide that you wanna run a lab experiment, the first thing that you think about is the theory that you have and then treatments. What are the treatments? What are the variables that you want to manipulate? And then maybe you'll have like two treatments, a control and another treatment or like whatever number of treatments that you have in order to test the theory that you have in mind. Then when you go actually and you wanna operationalize your experiment, you end up with a bunch of other decisions that you have to make. So if we think in the context of the music lab experiment, then the treatments are whether there is social influence or not. And then the outcome is the predictability of these uh, cultural marketplaces. And when you go and operationalize that experiment, you have to make many other decisions, which is how many songs to include. That is a parameter of uh, that actually you have to operationalize in order to study the things that you care about, although you might not care much about how many songs exist in your platform. Uh, when you are thinking of the context of the treatments here, two different network structures in terms of communication patterns, then the difficulty of the task or the type of task that individuals are doing, the proportion of expertise, the payoff, when you are thinking about, uh, for example, network structures, and I was talking with Sarah, and cooperation levels, for example. So whenever you have to actually go and build the experiment, you end up with many choices and decisions and parameters that you have to choose. And let me show you kind of an illustration of what that means. So once you actually, let's assume that you have two parameters that you care about and you have two treatments. So the two parameters could be in the music lab experiments, the number of songs, that's your X, that's parameter one, and another one, how salient the social signal is. Or when, for the example I gave on networks, it could be the difficulty of the task and the proportion of experts in the population, for example. Once you actually choose your treatment, you form these regions in the parameter space, so some technical term that some people use is these feasibility domains, which are just regions, these parameter values, under which your treatment will be effective. So if you choose this number of songs with this saliency of social signals, then you will find the effect that you are looking for under these, under these parameter or under these conditions. And once you choose another network structure, so let's talk about networks, so you choose the efficient network and then you choose a more inefficient network, then you form another region in the parameter space, in these two parameters, where you'll find that uh, the second network will actually promote the desired behavior or the behavior that you are looking for. So in this case would be collective intelligence or wisdom of the crowd. So if you choose a value of the parameters that are inside these colored regions, you'll find that one network is better than the other. So what then happens 
is that the first group or researcher runs their first experiment. So what they care about is network structure. So they have these two treatments. They manipulate that, but then they have to operationalize all of these other things. They do, and then they run that experiment, which is that one point in the parameter space. And then they conclude that network A is, or network one is better than network two, because network one can promote collective intelligence while network two doesn't. And this, is, this might sound like an intuitive result to the editors and reviewers, but it's about networks, so it's still nice. So it gets published in some decent venue. Then this other research group runs a similar experiment, and then they find the opposite results. And this result is now a little bit more counterintuitive, and they get to say that everyone says X, but we actually show Y. And it's about networks, so this is really kind of interesting. So it gets published in a really fancy journal. And then a third experimenter will run an experiment and say, you know what? Network structure does not matter for collective intelligence. Like we run this experiment, we manipulated network structures. It's just not related. And this is something that no one really wants to hear. So at best it will end up on archive. And that last one is actually a true story. Just say. <laughs> so this is actually reminds me of the story of uh, the blind monks and the elephant. So the story goes, I'm sure many of you have heard, they encounter an elephant for the very first time and they try to conceptualize or understand what an elephant is. So these monks touch different regions, different regions of that elephant and the one that's touching the trunk will end up saying that, oh, an elephant is something that looks like a snake. The one who's touching the tail will say it looks like a rope. The one who's touching the leg would say it's like a pillar. And they would think that they are, there is like ill intentions from the others or they are cheating or doing something wrong. And it's only, and no matter how many times, so it's not a problem of replications, no matter how many times you touch, you end up with the same conclusion as long as you are touching the same region. And it's only when you try to put these things together or touch different regions until you actually really understand and be able to conceptualize what an elephant is. So when I talk about virtual lab experiments, I'm not talking about really just running more of the same experiments. What I envision is something that goes like this. So you have this thing that really reduces the cost of running experiments, of explicitly defining what the parameters are, and it gives you all of these wonderful things, which is the web. But then when you run your experiment, you should actually understand that that results that you found are under particular conditions of your experiments, of the environment that you put your participants in. And then that process, although the running of the experiment itself has been automated with the web, so you can be asleep and collect data about the condition that you pre-specified, what is not automated is which conditions should we run. So can, can actually the thing is the virtual lab itself runs an experiment while you're asleep and before you wake up, it processes that samples and decides what the follow-up experiment should be if we want to, uh, to, ma to maximize or optimize our understanding. So that means that the virtual lab platform has to take in the results of that running experiment, see what are the conditions that these results were found, and then it should suggest to the researcher what is the next experiment that you should run in order to break your results. Not necessarily to break your results, but actually to efficiently is explore that parameter space, what is the best other region that you should touch if you want to actually see to what extent your results are true or how the qualitative behavior can change under different conditions. So it's like this dependence on context. And then you can go back and forth such that you can efficiently either yourself or across different research teams be able to kind of explore that parameter space and then ask different type of questions about the phenomena that you are interested in. So for example, if you talk about, your orga orga about a particular organization, then the question is, in which, which part of this parameter space is relevant to my organization because those experiments will be relevant to my intervention. If my organization of, is of a particular size with a particular type of task and individuals, then I'm not necessarily interested about results that are true under very different conditions. And the other thing that you can as well learn from this are what are the promising regions in the parameter space that are worth applying and, and designing in the real world, which kind of it's more of like a social technology or what the organizations or companies are interested in, which is I don't necessarily want just to understand what people are doing and the settings that I have and what 
different interventions would work, but what would be the best context to put these individuals in to make the best decisions in the context of collective performance. So to that end, uh, um, and please feel free to ask me any questions at any point. Maybe I said this a little bit late in the presentation, but as well, if there is anything that you want us to talk about more, I'm happy to do so, and we can as well talk more about other things uh, after, the, after the presentation. So kind of to this end, and as we said, this is actually just running experiment is difficult and kind of running experiments where it allows you to automate the process of selecting and uh, exploring the parameter space and the different conditions and the different parameters that you should look at is even going to be more technically challenging. We built Empirica, uh, the platform that Matt mentioned. And actually I started with Empirica uh, when kind of to give a little bit of context, my background is more of like computer science and applied mathematics. And I started to do a little bit more theoretical work on the things that I'm interested in. But then I really got interested in experiments and I had to build an experiment and then kind of see that there aren't many tools. And although I'm kind of considered a computer scientist, it is not easy to build an experiment because of all of the edge cases and all of the things and moving parts that one have to consider. So I kind of started that before at the beginning of my PhD, like building something for myself that I can just to run this one experiment that kind of corresponds to my one model. And it just took so much time that I knew that if I wanted, if a reviewer asks for another condition, that's the rest of my PhD, right? I will be only able to run two experiments. So when I actually joined the, the Summer Institute and I had the chance to see things like uh, uh, wiki surveys and talk kind of with the, with the people who were kind of doing similar things, it motivated me to actually build an open source platform of this and have other people contribute to the project. So we called it Empirica and it does two main things. One that I think is unique to Empirica and another is more shared with other platforms that claim to be doing virtual lab things. So the more unique thing is that, or let me maybe start with the thing that is common with other platforms. So it's an open source fr full framework that allows you to reduce the cost and the effort you need to run group online experiments with real time interaction. So it makes it extremely easy to run these types of experiments in real time, as well as synch uh, asynchronous and sequential experiments on networks or on not, if people have to be working simultaneously or arriving sequentially, like the music lab, building uh, prediction markets and all of these things. And at the same time, provide a, uh, a well-developed API and backend that does a lot of the things that researchers care about, but they don't want to develop, like randomization across conditions, designing the space of, exper of, of conditions that they care about, dealing with disconnections, dropout, recruitment, and all of these other things. The unique thing about it, I think, is that it forces the researcher, or oh, well, let me not say force, it encourages the researcher to actually be explicit about all of the choices that they are making while they are developing the, exp the experiment. So while you are not maybe interested in varying all of these variables, and I wouldn't encourage you to do so because you can see that with a simple experiment, so this is actually an interface for an experiment that we run, and the thing that we care about is a static versus a dynamic network. So people get to rewire or they, they don't choose who their neighbors are. But we actually had to make all of these other decisions in order to run our experiments. So what is the size of the network? What is the rewiring frequency? What is the type of feedback that they see? What is the communication format they have? How many neighbors would they have? All of these things we had to make decisions about. And then what the platform is making us do is that you have to make that explicitly. Like these are decisions that could have varied, but you're keeping constant in your experiment. Then you get to design your treatment out of that uh, space of possible experiments. And you can see that it kind of the size of possible experiments explode. And you're maybe only because of your theory or interested in one element. So you get to actually say that this is the thing that I want to vary. These are the things that I say they don't matter, but I have to operationalize or they don't matter for my theory. And this actually allows researchers to, co to collaborate. So one thing that we are trying to do is to actually to work with other researchers who are interested in the same outcome, so team performance, but they think different things matter. And then what we tell them is that, you know what? You take this, you go and vary the things that you think matter. I'll go and vary the things that I think matter. So we are exploring different regions in the parameter space, but at least I know how many 
changes do I have to make to go from my experiment into exactly your experiment? And actually be, have estimates that are comparable with each other and makes a meta-analysis or synthesis of these res results more attainable and more useful. So that's, that's, that's kind of, the, the, I think, the unique thing about the, the platform. But then you get to actually, there is kind of an admin UI component to it, which masks a lot of the complexity about, oh, do I need a lobby where I have people to wait so they start playing the game or the experiment together, or do I want them to arrive sequentially? And as well, the logic that you can have in there. Like what happens if you don't get the number of people you want? Do we want us to start anyway? Do you want us to form a smaller, a smaller teams? Do you want us just to cancel the experiment? You get like to specify all of these kind of nitty gritty kind of logic that you would need to code just by providing the researcher with an interface. Also, it provides a lot of the procedural control about your randomization in a well-tested way so you can decide what type of randomization would you want to have and as well the parameters of your randomizations and it will be implemented for you. So really all you have to do is to think of the experiment from the perspective of one condition, from the perspective of one participant and develop it and then it will work for all participants in all conditions and you don't have to think about checking if these two participants are in the same world, in the same treatment, or they are in a different one. It just will work. Whenever you are talking about it, you are talking about the same thing. Uh, so it's scoped kind of correct, correctly. Kind of to maintain flexibility of we wanted people to actually, so one thing we do when we, are, when we started working with Empirica is to go to people who want to run experiments and tell them, what is the optimal experiment that you want to run? Because one thing that we noticed when you meet with people who have interest in running these experiments, with who have backgrounds that are not necessarily in, 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 in computer, computer science fields, let's say, they sometimes change the optimal, so they have the optimal design to test the thing that they wanna test, but then because they know that they wanna use Qualtrics or like O3 or something like that, they have to compromise what the experiment is in order to something that these tools can accommodate. So one thing that we do is we go to them and tell them, you know what? Tell us what is the optimal net, uh, uh, experiment that you want to develop. Don't worry about the technology or the feasibility of implementing it. What is the best way to answer the question that you want to answer? And then the, we kept doing that exercise as we were developing Empirica and the API at the beginning because one thing we wanted to do is that it's not only allowing us to run the type of experiments that we want to run and then end up people ending up needing to change the type of experiments they run uh, in order to fit to the framework, but to make it flexible enough such that it can accommodate very different types of experiments. So synchronous, asynchronous, prediction market types of experiments, networked experiments, a single individual experiments, experiments that are happening over long horizons of time. So experiment that can run for a month continuously, but kind of asynchronous or an experiment that happen only like for 10 minutes. And we had like to able to be accommodate that. So one thing that made us do, which is to have a programming component to it. So it's not fully UI configurable, but you actually have to do something. So you have an API that actually determines what happens at different points in the game. And you just get and set value to different objects. It's all in the tutorial and on the online website. I thought it wouldn't be really useful like to go into these things if people haven't seen JavaScript before, but it's just like getting and setting values into objects and then it will work. You don't care about is this value synchronized across all people who are in the same condition in the same world. It will just work. And whenever you say that I wanna do something at this particular stage or round, it's the current stage or round. You don't have to check which stage you are in or what round. So it's really reducing the number of queries that you have to run and things will just work in the back end. So there are several uh, example, so we have community demos section on the Empirica website where the experiments that we developed and other people have developed, one thing that we ask, so at the beginning, and we still do, so this is a chance for people who wanna use it for next week, uh, is that we help people to actually develop their experiment and all we ask in return is to make their code publicly available in the and as a community demo. So whatever, and it doesn't have to be right, uh, right, uh, right away. So some people are concerned about like publication and things like that. Upon publication, they have to make their experiment online and in return, we will actually help you and make sure that you deliver the best experiment that, that you wanna uh, uh, deliver to your participants. So some, there are 
on the community website, you'll find several from actually interactions between human and AI. So actually you can embed artificial actors and algorithms to actually interact with individuals and measure things about them and manipulate things very easily to more traditional kind of psychology type of experiments, but this time done in groups uh, as well. Uh, more kind of complicated task where people get to chat and they get to solve these constraint satisfaction and optimization problems and manipulating things about the environment like the difficulty of the task, the type of individuals and things like that they are in the group and many other forecasting prediction market type of tasks. There are several papers now so actually Empirica really was kind of in beta a year and a half ago and we were really glad to see that there are some papers that are already published. There are other papers that are under review and many more examples you will find on, on the website. And surely I have to say, I guess that there are other tools out there other than Empirica, to be fair, that we learned a lot from and they are worth mentioning here. So if you think Empirica is not the right thing, there are these other ones. <laughs> But according to this figure with fake, da with fake data that I made, we're the best. <laughs> so you have that. And uh, sure, there are so many things actually that you can do. So that's people sometimes ask me like, okay, this is really cool. What can, how can we get started? So you can help us actually by if you feel adventurous to actually build your experiment on Empirica for next week if that's something that you are going to do and we'll be more than happy to actually help you uh, through it and have something functional hopefully before the end of the week with data. Uh, as well if you think that you know ex uh, experiments are not my thing, I don't believe in experiments, I will never run one any, then you can maybe tell your colleagues who run experiments about the platform because actually there is this network effect on this platform. Uh, the more we have examples and the more we have people from different fields running their experiments on the platform, the more appealing it is, the easier it is for others to use because they have all of these examples that they can copy parts of the code and it's very modular so they can like combine different experiments and create uh, new ones. But as well, the uh, this gets me kind of to the financial model that we are using to sustain this platform, which is if you say, you know what, this is cool, but I don't think it's worth my time to actually learn anything about JavaScript, no matter how easy your platform makes it to do my experiment. We have a network of professional developers who actually have developed Empirica experiments in the past and know how to talk with researchers and how to run experiments so they can develop experiments for have quite, I would say, cheap uh, hourly rate, very sophisticated experiments uh, very quickly. And those are the same developers who are developing the core of Empirica. So they are kind of, we're trying to create an incentive for them to continue to develop the open source project to bring more people in to do that. But we are reaching a point where we actually need more financial support to sustain some of the activities that we are doing and to keep up with the demand and the, the, uh, that uh, as more people are using the platform to actually resolve issues on GitHub and things like that. Uh, so if you have any ideas or thoughts or anything, you always can as well come and help us with that. And finally, if you just want to talk about it, you have, you're a designer, you're a programmer and you want to contribute to the project, you think you have, we have features that are missing or conceptual things that we actually have to include, you always, we're always happy to talk to everyone and really have them on board in the team and actually work on this and we can invite you to the Slack channel where we are doing a lot of these things. So thank you very much. I hope I motivated some of you to consider using it. And if you want to talk about collective intelligence or experiments, I'm here for the rest of the day to do that. Thank you. So let's go like this. All right, thanks. This is really cool. This seems like a really great platform for exploring the parameter space, as you're saying, and like the implicit in the idea of the collective intelligence stuff is this idea of um, these nonlinearities between the parameters, because if it was easy to model them linearly, we wouldn't have to explore the whole space like this, right? 
So I'm worried, though, about when it comes time to, because when people are trying to apply this knowledge that you're generating, it almost certainly won't be on this platform, right? They're going to do it in different contexts. And so the real world is itself infinitely high parameter. And so in a context in which you're worried about nonlinearities between the parameter space, are you concerned about um, people doing everything on this platform, essentially overfitting to this platform, and then decreasing out of sample performance to parameters that vary off this platform? Like in the real world, like it's hot or cold in the room. Yeah. No, I think uh, this is a great question. Uh, should I repeat the questions for the online people, or do they hear it already from the microphone? Okay. So basically, in short, the question is, what if the real world parameter values don't directly necessarily map? I, or I'd say maybe this is a fair way to say it, to the parameters that you choose in your experiment. And I think this is a fair question and to be taken seriously when developing lab experiments that the results that come out of these experiments not to be taken literally. But actually all of these regions in the parameter space is to be kind of understood in this comparative static way where you say, you know what, for example, I would expect like in the music lab, the, potentially the number of songs matter on how predictable the, 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 the market is in terms of hits. And then it's, they, they run an experiment with, I don't remember, was it 48? 48. Yeah, so like with 48 songs, and they found, for example, with a particular way of making the, the, the social signal uh, salient, but then does that mean, and then maybe you run it with a smaller number of songs and you find that it becomes really predictable, a larger number of songs, it's like there is an interaction between as well, like how salient the information is and what the size of the choice set is. And what you should learn from that experiment is kind of the qualitative behavior that under when the number of songs is small or change, it can qualitatively change the behavior of your cultural market. And not to take the number 48 to be literal or exact, which is the boundary condition under which if you pass, then you have this phase transition and you end up in a different regime. So it's not to be taken like that. And I don't think even you can, one thing you're absolutely right about is that sometimes the parameters we care about in the real world are hard to measure. You can't even measure them in order to be able to map them to where they are in, the, in these experiments. And the second thing, they change. So things in the real world change over time, while kind of this thing has a more of a static view to things. And this is actually relevant to my own research in collective intelligence, which is trying to use these experiments to test uh, mechanisms that can promote collective intelligence in non-stationary environments, because we don't know what is the region we care about. We don't know exactly what is the parameters we care about in the real world. So let's forget about what these values really are because they change by the time that you figure out what they are. And how can we provide things or mechanisms or tools to those individuals such that they can themselves change the, so it's adaptive kind of uh, uh, treatment. So they change what the structure look like such that it's adaptive to whatever environment they are in. And usually these environments as well very high dimensional. So even individuals don't know what environment and context and parameters values they are in, but they get some noisy signals about that. So how can we deal with it? So I think these are the kind of the two answers. One is to kind of recognize that and maybe change the type of questions that people ask. And the second thing for these experiments, you can learn a lot from them, but they don't I would, um, that maybe that's more of an opinion thing. They shouldn't be taken literally, but more in a comparative static way. And then we can go to you, Yuan, and then to you there. Okay, go okay. ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Can and you please creating... mention your name? And uh, before, oh, sorry, sorry, your name, sorry, just not. Kevin. Kevin. Ah, I'm Monica. Okay. Uh, thanks for a great talk and for creating this tool. I really look forward to trying it out in my own experiments. I have two questions. Uh, so one is about dropout rates. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you're in the lab, that it's really unlikely that one of participants will just stand up and just leave the lab. Uh, and if you have like experiments involving group interaction in groups of three, four or five people, if someone drops out after half an hour, I mean, it's just really wasted. Um, the whole like half an hour is just wasted for other participants and for you as, as the experimenter. And I was wondering how you deal with that. And the second question is about creating group identity when you run uh, exp like group experiments in virtual labs. Because my impression is that uh, it's easier to create group identity if you have people in like the physical lab and it will be much harder to do it in uh, online environment. So 
So I was wondering what are your thoughts and maybe you have some suggestions how to deal with that. Sure. Uh, let me talk about, so the first one is about dropout. And this is an interesting and a, it's difficult to have a clear cut answer to it because it depends, right? So sometimes, so even if you want to generalize your results to a platform, so you want to create a virtual lab that looks like Twitter, for example, so like a platform where it's like a microblogging platform or something like that, and you want to have full control and use, like have participants be there necessarily maybe for a full day or maybe for longer, and then you will have different, like you have dropout rates, right? And that's actually something that maybe is relevant to your experiment because your outcome is what is the dropout rate. So it's not an issue, it's not a bug in that type of an experiment, but it's something that you wanna do, like uh, you wanna study and under which conditions the dropout rate will go up or down. So how can we actually have people more engaged in this? The other thing is dropout rates when you don't desire it. And this is kind of, I think it happens more often online for different things because as you don't have the physical thing, you can trap them for an hour and just have them do it. They get kind of the leader of doing it on their own time. And they might drop out and I think that would definitely correlate with how boring the task is, uh, could be. Uh, and this is kind of an incentive for researchers to create more interesting, engaging tasks, uh, potentially. But then as well, what does a dropout mean? Would mean different things based on the context. So if dropout is random, so people disconnect, people, machines just freeze and they just like drop out from experiments and it's independent of the treatment of, of your group interaction thing, then you might not really care about, uh, you wouldn't care much about this dropout because it's happening random and maybe it's equal across treatment or something like that. So maybe it's not having a big effect. But actually if the dropout is a function of the treatment, so some conditions are more boring and people are more frustrated. So actually this is something that happened to us. So we had people come into an, ex uh, an experiment, they did some tasks individually and we measure many things about them, like their social perceptiveness, their ability in the task, their cognitive style, like how do they solve the problem, and we study all of that behaviorally. And then we bring them back and we put them in teams with different compositions. So we put team with people with different cognitive styles or the same cognitive style, the same skill or variance in skill and things like that. And one thing we found that if you have people with uh, low social perceptiveness teams, then people were less happy about their team members, especially when they had like low skills, and there was higher dropout rate that we actually had to deal with it. And you can imagine that actually by creating sometimes a treatment that creates a special experience that increases the age or the number of people drop out can affect the results, but at the same time in this case we found it to be interesting too, which is kind of people quitting and saying, you know what, you continue doing the experiment, I don't wanna get the payoff, right? So that's kind of, and that might actually happen in real, teams who are not working well. Uh, so that's the question about the dropout. The second question was? Group identity. Group identity. So this, I wouldn't be the best person to, 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 to answer that question. Some maybe more like social psychologists who study group identity will have better idea. I know of some work, including a little bit of mine that says the contrary. It's actually very easy to create group identities on kind of things that are not very salient. And the paper that uh, Matt mentioned, which was my project uh, for, uh, for the Summer Institute, was to show that there is, if you actually have people play a dictator game and you have workers who are all from MTurk, from the same crowd uh, sourcing uh, platform, or someone from MTurk and someone from Crowdflower or from, from some other platform, or a cloud worker with someone else random in the world, the cooperation levels will actually decrease as you make kind of uh, the identity, uh, as you change identities of the partners. So that's kind of, maybe that's, that, that, that's not a good enough answer to say that actually it's as salient, but I'm sure, I've, I've seen some research on uh, guilds and online games and like uh, in-group bias and things like that manifesting themselves to a high degree there that is that could be comparable to, to, to a physical lab setting, but I wouldn't be able to, to actually give you a, a really good empirical answer or, or reflection on that. Cool, so maybe you want. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I just want, wondering um, the challenges of specified parameters. Like if we want to measure the difficulty, we may have different dimensions like uh, some text needs, needs more like patience, some need more like, uh, for example, some special skills. So it's really 
I feel, I feel like it's really hard to specify the, the most useful parameters. And also the, the other thing is that um, there might be some um, unobserved, uh, unobserved variables that are equally important, like the, like the time. Maybe the same text that was done yesterday will, will be, have a different outcome than today. So I, I, I know it could be very challenging, but. Yeah, no, the, 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 this is a great question. And I think there are maybe at least two ways I can think of that can kind of get at it. One is, how do you specify the parameters that actually matter? Like you, 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 there are parameters and actually you, you always can ignore something that someone else thinks is important, right? And that usually appears in the, during the review process. Ah, what about this thing? Uh, uh, and then uh, what we are, do, we are trying to solve it at least in two ways. One is to actually organize a workshop with people who are interested in the same outcome from different fields and just say, what are the theories that you have about collective performance? Let's take the union of all of the things that we think matter. So we are like four or five different teams from different fields. Let's take the union of that. Let's define that as the parameter space that we start exploring. But then there is always the opportunity for someone to come and say, ah, you forgot this one, uh, that one. And actually it happened in our case, which is we thought that we, everything that we chose, we specified as a parameter. But then someone came in and said, ah, you didn't specify the social communication format. Now you show them the answer of the others, but what if you add a chat instead? And then that's not a parameter. So what is the choice of like communication format? What this platform allows you to do is that to go and add a new factor. So you say, okay, I will take, you'll take my experiment and you say, you're missing that thing. If, I, if we're missing it, that means we operationalized it, but we, and had some value for it, we just didn't specify it as a parameter. And then you say that, okay, it's a communication format. For in your case, it's a numerical. That's what you chose as default. But I'll add that factor and I'll add the option of face-to-face -face interaction or a video interaction and a chat box. And then you add that and then this gets pushed to everyone who's actually running that. So you can cumulatively add more parameters. But then you are asking that, and, and I, I'm not necessarily saying that this is the best thing to do or even to agree on what the parameters are in the beginning, but it's kind of, it, 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 it allows for uh, what you mentioned, which is there is kind of unknown variables. And I think that's, that should be addressed or that's the part of the goal of theory. So theory actually tells us what parameters we should care about. And if there is a theory that why this thing should happen differently today or like on, on Saturday that on, on a weekday, then that theory should inform which parameters to actually include. And if you say that there are things that are weird that are happening that you are seeing in the experiment of inconsistencies that might be in, uh, interacting or con being conditioned on these unobserved parameter, then it would be the role of theory to actually tell what parameter it is for maybe it's oh the color of the avatars that people have or the color of the payment they get or something like that the theory of color uh, and its effect in order to be included in this in this uh, in this exp in this framework and that would be one way kind of to address that maybe I, I'm not quite understand how the tool relates to the uh, high dimension of the hypothesis or the, Sorry, some the high dimension of the hypothesis or the parameters, like so. The uh, repeat the question from the beginning. I didn't hear the first part. I'm Sorry. not quite understand how the tool relates to the high how dimensionality. The how the how your tool uh, relates. relates to the. Is, is it about the the de declaring part or? So I'll tell you how what it what it allows the tool. The tool allows the automation of selection of conditions. So you can say that. I want to run this experiment on a group. So it's kind of uh, just one trial or two or three or five or whatever, or you and have a condition or a program that tells it what is the next condition that it should run. So for example, assume that you have like multiple arms, you have multiple treatments. And what you say, you say, I want to like run enough of these experiments until these two things are different. And then I want to stop running this experiment because I'm already learned that this treatment is not good. I want to now sample another treatment. So it's kind of, it allows you to sample from the parameter space in whatever way that you want. One way that okay, we are doing this, so it's kind of providing the ability to do that. And then okay. you can do it even, you can do it manually. You yeah. can do it 
some algorithmically yes. of what treatments to, say, uh, to, to run next. One thing that we are trying to do now is kind of to do it algorithmically, to do it in a distributed way. So different people are running their own experiments that they are interested in. All of that is being fed back to a kind of uh, a learning algorithm that's trying to estimate what are the promising regions in the parameter space. And then suggesting to the researchers, oh, maybe you should stop changing how many participants are there, like the group size, because we kind of learned what that does. It's more interesting to run this condition where you vary this other thing, where we have not enough data to actually say anything about. So it's kind of having a more of a, like a reinforcement algorithm there that's mm -hmm. sitting at the back and looking at the results of different experiments that are in different regions and telling them or suggesting. And then, because some treatments, sometimes they don't make sense. Like there are some treatments, some combinations of factors that you just don't care about. And actually this goes back into evaluating the significance of some of the interesting or surprising results in the literature. Because sometimes you find results that are counterintuitive, counter but then they are true and they're very narrow region in the parameter space. So like they are very specific conditions under which this counterintuitive result is true. And it's unrelated to the things that we care about in the real world. And so how significant that result is. It is surprising, but it's irrelevant, which is, which is different from an, a result that is surprising and important because it's actually in a region that we care about. So kind of the mapping and the exploration, we don't, the tool doesn't tell you how to do it, okay. but it's providing hooks that allows you to experiment with different ways of doing it. Um, first of all, I'm very fascinated by your project. I think it's nearly great. It kind of um, helped me to recall my face in the user of experiments in social sciences, because I'm doing mostly sort of testing, interesting testing, sociological theories, like the individual um, be, human behavior, so it's nearly great. But my question is about like, um, how I can manipulate environmental variable if I'm doing experiment on your platform. If you're doing? Environmental variable. Individual level. Uh, environment, the, the impact of environmental variable on the, um, the agents mm -hmm. in the, uh, if I'm doing experiment on your platform. So the question I'm thinking about is, if I'm thinking there could be bi-directional interaction between environmental variable and agents. It's not only environmental affecting the agents, but also agents can shape uh, the characteristics of the environmental variable. So it's like, you know, feedback effect is going on. Is there any way in which I can do that in, in, on yeah, your platform? So, so it's actually, have we done that? Or is there an experiment that did that? So I can see how that can be done on Empirica. I'm not sure that if someone has done it, because once you are actually in the environment as an experiment designer, you have access to all of the parameters of the environment from within the interface of the, of the, of the, of the tool. So one thing you can say that, oh, if the agent takes this action, then this parameters should, ch should change. So the treatment should actually change for the next period or for the next time that they are doing the task. And, uh, is that answering the question? I'm not sure that I understood the question correctly, which is, is the question that, what if you want to have an interaction between the individual and the environment? So kind of individuals are shaping their environment and then the environment in return is kind of maybe shaping the decision-making process or the actions of the agent. And if that, that is the question. Okay, so yeah, it is enabled. You could do that, like if we sit together, maybe I can like show you where these things should go in order for, for us to enable that. This is a very interesting design that I don't think people have done it. What people have done is these kind of within subject uh, uh, design where they have people and then they do like, they are in one condition and then at some point in the experiment, they are moved into another condition and these are pre-specified. But if you want like to dynamically decide what the next treatment should be, it should be, it is possible to do that. Is it? We have a question from uh, the live stream coming from Mexico. Alejandro first says, congratulations on the platform. Uh, second, he asks, uh, is there a way we can configure the language shown to participants or does the platform work entirely in English? Ooh. So there is the, so when you think about the, the expert of, of, uh, of Empirica, you can think of three different uh, actors interacting with it. One is the experiment 
designer. It's the one who's conceptualizing what the experiment look like. And this is maybe is the PI or like the, the graduate student who's working on this experiment. And they are provided with a, a UI that allows them to control a lot of the things about the experiment and requires no programming. And this UI is in English. So it's like how to assign treatments, the lobby, how is it within subject, like all of these different decisions. The parameters, all of these are defined from an interface that is supposed to be uh, uh, working with uh, or worked by the, 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 the designer of the experiment. Then there is the experiment developer, which is the one who's touching the code. And that's in JavaScript. And in that case, it's the one who's responsible for a little bit of filling the functions that I've shown before, like the methods to dealing with the API, but as well with components of the UI that will be presented to the user. And that can be in any language. It's kind of a string. It's like an HTML, CSS, uh, using React, and we have like our own libraries for things that are usually used like for uh, that researchers are interested in, like a timer or something like that. And that's just like regular UI. You can do any language for the participants to do that. And then the, you have the participants and the experiments, which will actually interact with that interface using the logic that is determined by the experiment designer. So it's kind of it goes back and forth. So that, the, the question is, can I run it with uh, participants who are non-English speakers? If you develop your experiments where the components in the UI are not in English, that will be fine. I think actually we have an experiment in German by some people in Max Planck. So that's an example of that. OK, I guess that's it. OK, cool. Thank you. Any questions? Let's thank